before we get into today's episode, I just want to share, I know we're towards the end of the month, I'm always late to do everything, but uh, the candle company, my candle company, Knox and Vesta, is donating 10% of all of our profits for anything purchased on the website to donate to the Trevor Foundation. And for the record, that is in addition to the other five charities that we regularly donate a portion of our proceeds to already. So if you wanna go ahead and check out the candle company, knoxvesta.com, links will be in the description box, no matter if you're listening to this on YouTube or in podcast format. And with that being said, enjoy today's episode. Do you have a death plan? That might be an extremely personal question, but it's not one that we really ask all too often. Aside from a will, do you have anything set in place? Do you know what kind of burial you'd want, what your options are, and how much that might cost? Chances are that for many of you, the answer is no. Death is an uncomfortable topic to discuss, but it's also an inevitability, whether we like it or not. And unfortunately, if you don't have a death plan of any kind, it means that your loved ones while grieving you will have to navigate a largely broken and difficult industry after your passing. Let me put it into perspective. Imagine someone dear to you has just died. First, you need to obtain a legal declaration of death and have a medical professional declare them dead. Then while you're still mourning, you need to do this in the span of a few days, choose a funeral home, Choose whether you want to cremate or bury them, order an urn or a tombstone, research funeral prices, ask people to eulogize, plan a service, write an obituary, secure the deceased property, get their mail forwarded, and notify their employer and other friends or family. Hopefully, your loved one in question will have some of this chosen or outlined for you, but still, are you feeling overwhelmed yet? This also does not include obtaining a will and meeting with a trust and estate attorney, which thankfully can wait a bit longer than the rest of that massive list. Chances are you don't want to deal with that and aren't even in the proper headspace to grieve, process this loss and arrange for a funeral. So when the funeral home you choose tells you that embalming is a standard and a necessary step to be sure that you can safely say goodbye to your loved one, you'll probably shell out the roughly $725 for them to do it. Do you want your loved one to have makeup on for the viewing? That will be another 250. And of course it's $425 for the use of the space and staff but you need those things to be able to say goodbye safely, or so you may be told, so you pay it. Then to bury your loved one, you'll need a concrete vault. Why? It's a requirement of the cemetery and you're in no position to question them, so you'll pay a thousand to $10,000 for that too. Then there's the cost of caskets to consider. You can buy one online for a thousand dollars, which is largely considered to be an affordable option. The average cost is closer to about $2,000 though, And according to the FTC, the prices can go as high as $10,000 for that. When all is said and done, you'll probably have spent somewhere around $7,360 for a funeral. That's the median cost in the US anyway. And if that sounds like a lot of money to you, you're not alone. Two thirds of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. So this funeral cost can be crippling. Some people need to take out funeral loans to pay for them. And some families can barely afford the $400 or so that a burial costs without any memorial service. The cost of cremation, while cheaper, isn't much better. Packages range from $2,000 to $10,000. And according to the NFDA Cremation and Burial Report, the cremation rate is projected to reach 70% by 2030. More demand means the price is also likely to increase too. Direct cremations in an alternative container with no viewing and no casket is the most affordable option. But again, it will still cost thousands. There are also viewing services, a casket rental for said services, and the embalming that may be done for a viewing, paperwork, flower arrangements, and an urn. Funeral homes need to be paid for their cremation services and workers need to be paid too, absolutely. But no one should be going broke trying to say goodbye to a loved one either. Frustratingly, funeral costs and the expense of death are not new challenges. In 1856, and yes, I said that, 1856, New York Times editorial said, that nobody that is not comfortably off in this world's goods can afford to die, referring to undertaker costs as bankruptcy. In 1951, a Collider article said that, quote, while the cost of living has risen 347% in the last 122 years, the cost of dying has rocketed as much as 10,000%. We pay so much for these death expenses, but stories of unclaimed remains being buried in mass graves, improperly stored remains, and coroners charging $1,000 just to turn remains over to families have made many people question what we're paying for. What is wrong with the funeral industry? Death is a part of life, whether we like it or not. So why is a necessity this expensive? Well, 
That's what we're gonna try to get to the bottom of. Today, we are at the viewing of the funeral industry before it reaches its final resting place in the corporate casket. Death is not an easy topic to cover. In fact, I'm sure there's many of you that are so uncomfortable with the notion that life is finite that, you know, we'll have to pass one day only for our bodies to feed a new industry. Today, we are taking an intimate look at the business of death, the funeral industry. Some of these costs may have surprised you or if you've had to deal with them, maybe not. Let's get into this by discussing the misconceptions around these services, like the fact that you literally don't even need them. In most states, it's actually 100% legal for you to fill out a death certificate and burial permit. And no, I'm not saying that means you should just call up a doctor, say your loved one died and bury them in your backyard. According to the Funeral Consumers Alliance, nine states require you to hire a funeral director, but most of the time you can prepare the body and hold a vigil yourself. You can book their burial with your local council, even order a coffin or shroud online. There are other options. Filling out a death certificate may be extremely difficult for a layperson, and chances are you may not want to do this as it's a lot to handle for someone that's grieving. But many people don't seem to be aware that this option even exists. Plus there's no harm in calling a funeral home and asking for help with filing a death certificate while taking care of your loved one at your own home. Some people may think that they can't even take part in this process in the first place. But let's say that you do want to hire a funeral home and not be involved. You may not understand everything that they're charging you for, but you pay it anyway because it seems like a necessity, like embalming, for example. If you're not aware, embalming is when a body's blood is drained and chemicals are injected to preserve it after death and keep it from decaying. This became popular after the Civil War as people wanted their loved ones, soldiers, to be returned home for burial. Thomas Holmes, or the father of modern embalming, popularized the service and is said to have embalmed over 4,000 men at about $100 a corpse at the time. The thing is, back then, this may have made sense. These bodies were traveling a great distance and it may have taken time in order to bring them back to their families. But today, in the vast majority of deaths, there's no need for this. Your friend or relative isn't going to be rotting away by the time you bury them. A refrigerator is absolutely fine, as cold and callous as that is to say. No state laws even require embalming, but according to CNET, the common misconception that the process is necessary for sanitizing the body and making it safe to be around still remains. The corpse itself isn't dangerous either, so there aren't really any benefits to be had for the family here. Caitlin Dowdy is a mortician and advocate for funeral reform who spreads awareness about death acceptance and misconceptions on her YouTube channel, Ask a Mortician. Fantastic channel, by the way. She's also written several books about these topics and I highly recommend Smoke Gets In Your Eyes, a great one. As she explains in her video, are dead bodies dangerous? Living bodies are generally speaking, far more dangerous than dead ones. Viruses, even deadly ones, can only live in a corpse for a few hours at most and dead bodies, unlike living ones, don't sneeze or cough, which would obviously spread these viruses. So then why do we think that dead bodies are dangerous? Why do embalmers wear a mask and biohazard suit when they work? Well, it's not necessarily because the bodies aren't safe, but because the embalming process itself can be unsafe for the living. Embalming fluid is, for example, extremely toxic. For decades, studies have shown that morticians are at far greater risk for several types of cancer because of their exposure. One particular kind of leukemia was more common among those within the funeral industry than the average person. So you might be wondering, well, why don't funeral workers just refuse to embalm? If it's not required and it's such a cancer risk, can't they just say no? The problem here is that it's become so common now. Embalming has become a standard and family members expect it. Formaldehyde is also better than arsenic, which was once used in embalming bodies and other non-formaldehyde products on the market don't compare. There are alternatives out there, but funeral directors know the risks and don't seem to care. Besides, since small improvements have been made in terms of workplace restrictions and safety, they're content with this. Michael J. Lensing, the co-owner of the Lensing Funeral and Cremation Service told the New York Times, "'In our new facility, the ventilation is very good. In our old facility, oh my God, it was different. Back in the 40s, when his grandfather got involved in the funeral industry, they didn't even have gloves or masks or ventilation. As another funeral director put it, I just love what I do. There's a risk associated with any occupation. So I'm willing to do what I do and let nature take its course. The reason why I bring this up is because this theme is so common within the funeral industry. 
The idea of, well, it's been this way forever, so why change it is everywhere. And I'm sure it doesn't help that actually changing things is hard, if not impossible with all the red tape in place. What is now a burial standard, having a casket inside a concrete vault, wasn't really used until the late 1800s. Since many cemeteries are privately owned, yes, even if they're considered a public cemetery, they can make their own rules. This includes that concrete vault or a grave liner, which often passes on an added expense to a grieving family. Sarah Chavez, one of the founders of the death positive movement and an executive director on the Order of the Good Death told CNET during an interview, I just got an email from a woman, an older woman today, and she said that when she buried her husband, the funeral home told her that it was the law that she had to buy concrete to put over the casket. Like with any funeral cost, this expense is going to vary greatly depending on where you go, but it can be yet another cost passed on to the consumers simply because the cemeteries require it. It's profitable and it makes for easy lawn maintenance after all. No problem though, you can just find a reputable cemetery because surely they're well-monitored and subject to similar standards, right? Well, this is again where the funeral industry is a bit of a mess. Cemeteries can be owned by an organization, town, city, county, or local government agency, but there's no national regulatory board that implements the same rules for all of them. There may be organizations like the Division of Cemeteries in New York that oversee the establishment, maintenance, and preservation of burial grounds for nonprofit cemeteries, but there's nothing nationwide. To boil it all down, when cemeteries individually make the rules, those rules can be harder to change and progress can stall. If you have to tackle this matter just one cemetery at a time, as opposed to putting a system in place that protects consumers, it's hardly any surprise why these questionable tactics continue. Again, that's not to say that all cemeteries are taking advantage of the power they have, but I think some basic guidelines could be useful here. For example, the FTC does have a funeral industry practices rule. In it, they say that providers of funeral goods and services must have a general price list or GPL that GPL must contain all the prices for their funeral goods and services with the exception of a separate price list being allowed for caskets and burial containers. The GPL also has to disclose that embalming is not always required by local law, alternative containers are available, and the only fee a consumer can be required to pay is a basic services fee. These rules lay the important groundwork as to how funeral homes can operate. Unfortunately, undercover inspections have revealed that these laws do get broken. The results of a 2015 to 2016 inspection revealed that none of the 10 funeral homes in Bakersfield, California made a priceless disclosure. Georgia, Michigan, Missouri, New Mexico, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Virginia, and Washington all had at least one funeral home in a major city or town fail the massive requirement as well. For New York, these numbers were especially dismal back in 2012, as an investigation by the Department of Consumer Affairs revealed that one in three NYC funeral homes failed to give consumers the right to privately review pricing information. A Funeral Consumers Alliance executive director, Joshua Slocum, also released a report in 2018 that said only 27% of funeral homes with websites even post a single price for their services. Before this episode, did you know that grave vaults can cost about $1,000 or what a casket costs or the varying prices in your area? Likely no, or at least I'd be a bit surprised if the answer is yes, but that can leave someone open to price gouging. It may be really hard to remember these things when you're grieving. So if you're only going to take away one message from this episode today, then it should be to know your rights. You can ask to review an all encompassing price list question options regarding embalming and explore other funeral homes too. Unfortunately, there are some funeral homes out there that don't want you to question them. They're still a business after all, and your grief just paints a target on your back. And before we explore that last point a little bit more, I'm going to take a quick moment to place today's sponsor here because there is really no other good place to place them. When you run a business, time is ever so precious. Every misplaced moment feels like a missed opportunity, a lost chance to make your business better, or even just step away for a second and recharge. ShipStation gives e-commerce sellers like you more time to do what they really love, unless you really love managing every single little detail of order fulfillment, which I most certainly do not. So it's really no wonder that ShipStation is already trusted by over 100,000 sellers. And with the amount of time that I save using ShipStation, I literally have all the time in the world now to be able to formulate new scents for the candle company and work on all the little nitty gritty details of design and upcoming launches. And it's great to have that extra time to focus on the creative while I don't have to focus on the fulfillment portion because ShipStation does it for me. 
What's also great about ShipStation is you're going to get some amazing, deeply discounted rates that are normally reserved for Fortune 500 companies. And they make it easy to compare carriers, rates, and delivery times. So it's easy to choose the best option for every shipping scenario. And in fact, 98% of companies that use ShipStation for a year keep it as long as they're in business. So I really think that says something as to how easy it is to work with them. So it's time to let go of all those shipping tasks. ShipStation can do it better and faster. Sign up using promo code CASKET for a free 60-day trial today at ShipStation.com and start saving time with every shipment. That's two whole months of shipping made quick and painless, and it's free to try. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, and type in CASKET. ShipStation, make ship happen. And now it's time to talk about the people that keep my sweater addiction going, even in the dead of summer, because nothing can stop me from an amazing sweater. And let's just be real for a moment here. Shopping for clothes can be an absolute pain in the tuchus. You never know if things are gonna fit, returns can be difficult, and sometimes you just don't even know where to start. But this season, let Stitch Fix do all the hard work for you, because they already do it for me, and I've, I've loved them for years at this point. And it's super easy to get started. You take a few minutes to set up your Stitch Fix style profile. You answer a few questions about what you like to wear and what you don't, and how open you are to trying new styles. Then their stylists go to work and they find items exclusively for you. Stitch Fix will send you five pieces to try on at home. You keep what you love and send back what you don't. Shipping returns and exchanges are easy and free. Plus, there's no subscription required. You can try it once or set up automatic deliveries. There again, no hidden fees, ever. Sign up for Stitch Fix and get the season's latest pieces for women, men, and kids. So if you sign up today at stitchfix.com casket, you'll get $20 off your first purchase. Again, that's stitchfix.com casket to get $20 off your first purchase. It's a limited time offer, purchase within two days of sign up. The stigma and lack of conversation around death allow bad faith actors to operate in the dark. The problem isn't any one individual or any one funeral home, but how this absence of discussion has such a hold on the industry. We can only change things by addressing them, but a public who isn't educated about the death industry won't ask questions or demand we do things differently. Many within the funeral industry genuinely want to help grieving families. And so long as we don't embrace their ideas for growth, we allow questionable tactics to remain unchallenged. We'll talk more about these changes in a moment, but for now, let's address the problems like the SCI. Service Corporation International or SCI is the country's largest funeral home slash cemetery chain. They had sales of $1.7 billion in 2005 and have more than doubled that to over 4 billion, according to their latest investor sheet. The funeral industry is a business after all. So while smaller and family run funeral homes aren't uncommon, the SCI has at least 16% of revenue in the death care industry all to itself. And I say at least 16% because they continue to buy up other funeral home chains and services at a fast pace. So that number from a 2017 report is bound to climb. They already have a 22.4% of profits if you're just focusing on the funeral homes in particular. Unfortunately, with the SCI being this big, they're able to put consumers in an awkward position where fighting back is intimidating. Take Lamar Hankins. His family purchased two cemetery plots in the 1960s. Then both Lamar and his parents had a positive experience at Greenlawn Memorial Park, where his brother was buried in 1998. As the name of the cemetery was not changed, he and his parents were not aware that SCI bought it up. Plus, since they had a good rapport with the longtime owner, Lamar's parents kept their plots at Greenlawn. Lamar came back a decade after his brother passed away to bury his mother, and then in 2011, his father. According to the Washington Monthly, the SCI told Lamar he had to pay a second interment fee to combine his parents' ashes into one cemetery plot. And they were also going to charge him for a polystyrene covering for his mother's remains, a total cost of $1,200. So why? Well, like we said earlier, cemeteries can make their own rules. In my opinion, the new owners of Green Lawn knew Lamar was in a tricky position. His brother was already buried there and surely it was important for him to keep his family together. Plus his parents already bought the cemetery plots. So it's not as if he wanted to go through the hassle of buying new ones. It's also worth mentioning that though in this case, it's not applicable since Lamar's parents were cremated, there's also the matter of time sensitivity. People don't want to pay a lot of money for storage fees and presumably would like to bury their loved ones as soon as possible. Certain religions even require or expect this. If a cemetery said to you, it'll be another thousand dollars to use the plots you already paid for, would you really have the strength to fight them? If you're nearly done with this entire exhausting, emotional and tragic process, wouldn't you just hand over the money to be done with it? 
a lot of people likely would, but Lamar had actually worked as a funeral consumer advocate since 1993. Whereas others may not know the state's burial laws and requirements, he did and called SCI out on their lie. Technically speaking, the SCI's actions didn't violate any federal law as their contract allows for them to change their terms at any time and add in these extra fees. Even so, their actions were scummy and exploitative, so Lamar moved his family to a different cemetery. It's frustrating because even when someone knows their rights, knows the law, and knows a cemetery is trying to take advantage of them, the best recourse is often to just move on. It's an unsatisfying result, especially for someone that literally worked as a funeral consumer advocate, but here we are. The SCI in particular, with its large chunk of the market pie, has prices that are 47 to 72% higher than other comparable funeral homes and cemeteries. Plus, unlike with other chains out there, whether it be McDonald's, Nike, or Louis Vuitton, you won't really recognize them as a brand. They keep the name of the family funeral home and customers don't know that they're walking into a chain. The workers there may genuinely care about you and your family's needs. That's not to say that every SCI funeral home doesn't but they are consistently not entirely transparent with consumers. Insider Exclusive lists their legal battles and misconduct, some of which is just downright disturbing. And if you're not in the headspace to hear about the mistreatment of a dead body, please feel free to skip ahead like a minute or so, because this is gonna be pretty upsetting. In one 2010 case, an SCI owned mortuary dropped a casket on the day a family was holding a funeral for their 20 year old son. His body rolled onto the pavement, and before you say this may have been just an accident, the employee then allegedly ran into the funeral home without saying a word, leaving the family with the body before eventually returning to put him back into the casket. The young man's father said that due to the quote, unimaginable sight of his son lying on the concrete spilling bodily fluids, that he's had horrific nightmares ever since. In May, 2015, Funeral Watchdog reported that another SCI cemetery upset a grieving family when the remains of a child from the 1950s had been buried in a plot that was already reserved. The plot had been previously purchased by a recently deceased 95 year old woman, Nana, so that she could be near her husband. Nana had to be buried elsewhere. And infuriatingly enough, this exact event had already happened to this family. They went through the exact thing when Nana's niece passed away and someone had already been buried in her plot. So you may be thinking, why not just demand accountability and fair prices from these companies? If you needed just about any service, you'd shop around until you find someone reputable with a fair price, right? Well, that's just not how a lot of the funeral industry works. According to Virginia R. Beard, a sociologist at Longwood University in Virginia, Most people, when they're making that purchase, either go where their family has always gone or they just go somewhere close because they're in a moment of grief. They're not shopping around. Preventing negative experiences is difficult when people don't wanna talk about death in the first place. Also, this is just my opinion, so feel free to take it or leave it, but I'm sure there may be an added element of guilt involved. People want to buy their loved ones the best to give them a proper send off and a nice casket or wreath of flowers or whatever it might be. Funeral homes, whether actively or passively, can take advantage of this. Grieving people are some of the most perfect people to upsell because of this. And even Joshua Slocum from the Funeral Consumers Alliance argues that people do tend to associate love for a deceased person with what you spend on their funeral. There are some things you can do to avoid being taken advantage of, like asking for the location of the cremation center and requesting a visit. They may not be set up for tours, but if they don't even give you an address, Slocum says, that's a deal breaker. Try to find a place that offers prices online, and if they don't, call to ask. As we've established, you have a right to know. You can also look up the laws in your area and determine just how involved the process is or you know how you want it to be. Maybe you want to take care of your loved one in your home, but not the paperwork. Maybe you want a viewing, but no embalming. You can even ask these questions now and come up with a death plan ahead of time. That way, your loved ones will know exactly what you want when you pass away. It's going to happen. We're all going to die someday, so we might as well prepare for it, right? This is where the death positivity movement comes in. While there is an element of sustainability, this isn't just about trying to greenwash death. It's about leaning into our natural curiosity surrounding death to quell fears. As Caitlin said, there's a lot out there for taboo topics, sex positivity, but so little for death positivity. This is one of the reasons she created the nonprofit, The Order of the Good Death. It's about being open and having honest conversations. After all, the only way to prevent misconceptions is by tackling something head on. This movement has gained a lot of traction in recent years too, showing itself in a whole variety of ways. 
a former nurse, Shotzi Weisberger, invited friends over to decorate her biodegradable cardboard coffin. At 91 years old, though she'll be 92 as of this episode's release, she's a powerful voice in the death positivity movement. As she explained, for the past several years, she's even created a bequeath list. Her friends and loved ones have placed little tags on different items. At the end of my life, I want people to come, say their goodbyes, pick up their items, and I don't want to be drugged. I don't want morphine, but I don't want to be in pain. So I have arranged for an acupuncturist to come if I am in pain. Obviously, not everyone is going to want exactly what Shotzi wants, but that's fine. Her message isn't about everyone getting an acupuncturist. It's about having options. As it turns out, more of these options are emerging in terms of burials too. Cremation is definitely the most popular alternative. It does release carbon dioxide and other emissions though, about the equivalent of two tanks of gas. But there are so many options and green burials come in many different forms. Some people are choosing to be wrapped in a plain shroud of natural fibers and placed in a wooded burial preserve with no concrete vaults, no tombstones, and no markers. A burial preserve like this is deep enough that animals can't get into it, but shallow enough that within a few months, only a dry skeleton will remain. Though prices vary from source to source, some say that a plot for a green burial is between 1,000 to 4,000. Services may be between 150 to 300 and a burial permit between 10 to $40. Overall, it's vastly cheaper than the cost for an average non-green burial. But there are even more unusual options for less. A company called Coeo sells a mushroom suit for $1,500. It's really a shroud lined with a flesh-eating fungi to ensure and hasten a body's return to nature. Not only are green burials sustainable and usually vastly less expensive, but these methods often speak to people too. There's something about returning to nature that's comforting and it can protect the land you're buried on too. In a conservation burial, the burial fees you pay are used to cover land protection, restoration, and management. The Prairie Creek Conservation Cemetery told the New York Times, not only does conservation burial help protect land, but the burial area becomes hallowed ground, restored to its natural condition and protected forever with a conservation easement. Citizens who support conservation are offered a more meaningful burial option with the certainty that protected land is the ultimate legacy to leave for future generations. Hell, I've even seen facilities that turn corpses into compost like Recompose. These services cost between $2,500 and $5,500, which again, can be a lot cheaper and better for the environment than what we consider to be traditional. Some companies have even advocated for the rhizometer, which would dissolve bodies in 150 degrees Celsius over 300 Fahrenheit water with potassium hydroxide. Everything would be sustainable and the water would be sent to a treatment plant for disposal. In the past, we've actually used this technology to dispose of cows during an epidemic. However, this has faced pushback in the UK because they had concerns about the liquefied remains of the dead going into the water system. At times, scaling this up can also be difficult as some green funeral companies may only perform 70 cremations a year with lengthy 12 hour ceremonies, whereas larger funeral directors can take on three to four cremations per day. Still, as more and more perceptions change, the industry can shift too. Hopefully we can continue to have these conversations, learn about our rights and our options and create death plans in advance. We are all going to die one day, but as morbid and depressing as that sounds, I think talking about it openly can be a comforting, accepting experience. And if it's not, that's also okay. We all have to choose what's right for us. But with all of that being said, that is where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you learned something new today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I also wanna give a special shout out to all of my patrons over on patreon.com slash Illuminati. We've got one of the nicest, chillest Discord servers to hang out in and some really cool benefits if you do decide to become a patron include bonus episodes. We recently just did one all about the history of the sham wow guy, which is very much a different twist from today's episode. But as always, thank you so much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.